Hello, this is Dr. Mary Grady, and I am here with a lecture called Fluid Balance. And uh, Fluid Balance, it's something to think about. It's the total effect of the water in your body is what we're going to be looking at. And age and sex and body fat do affect this total body water. Um, so to keep on going here, what is the function of water? Well, water is necessary because it works as a solvent for transport for all the electrolytes and the minerals that are in your bloodstream. And it also helps to eliminate waste through the kidneys, the skin, the lungs, and the GI tract. So this water is very necessary to help you do all of this. And it assists with temperature regulation, which is very important and a lubrication for joints. So water in your body is a very, very important thing. Now, I do want to point out that the portion of the water in your the total body water decreases with age. And if you start out with our infants, we'll talk about them first, they have the highest portion of water in their bodies, and it accounts for 70 to 80%. So if something goes wrong in one of these things we talked about, like elimination or um, they get sick and they decrease their body weight, this one they can get dehydrated very quickly. Um, in individuals older than 60 years of age, water represents about 50% of their total body weight. And just so you know, women have less than men. And... Um, this, this uh, water is very, very important for all the things that the body has to do. The ability of the body to adjust fluid has a big impact on electrolyte balances, and this is influenced by a lot of different factors. So we want to regulate and have all of this in place because we want homeostasis. A living thing has to have equilibrium to survive. And so having our fluid and that water that I just talked about in the right spaces is very important. If you look, you have water, extracellular, intracellular, interstitial, and transcellular. So water is all through. This is like a little bit of an anatomy review for you. If you look at this page, it talks about how diffusion, how the transport of these electrolytes and particles through the cell membrane is very, very important thanks to the fluid volume in your body. And these electrolytes also go in and out uh, between the cells and out of the cells with sodium pumps. And glucose cannot enter most of the cell membranes without the help of insulin. So there's all these factors that are helping water and electrolytes kind of go between all those uh, spaces that we talked about earlier. So, here's, here's how it goes. Um, um, blood flows to the glomerulus, and you have these cells that secrete the renin into the bloodstream. And renin travels to the river, or li river, travels to the river, to the liver. And renin converts into angiotensin in the liver. It goes from that to also angiotensin 1. And this 1 travels to the lungs. And then 1 is converted in the lungs to 2. And what does that have to do with anything? Well, then number 2 travels to the adrenal glands. And it's here in the adrenal glands that it produces and releases um, aldosterone. And aldosterone is this substance that causes the kidneys to retain sodium and water. And sodium and water retention can lead to increased fluid volumes and sodium levels. So this water that's all on our body, that's in all these different spots that we talked about on an earlier slide, is also regulated by many different components in the body, like angiotensin and aldosterone. So that's just something to keep in mind. I'm not going to go that in-depth with you on a test, but you kind of need to know that to understand where all these things come together. And your blood pressure is also part of all this fluid volume as well. And it's regulated by renin and aldosterone that we just talked about. I also want you to note that when blood volume drops, aldosterone initiates the active transport of this sodium from distal tubules and 
collecting tubules, it puts it into the bloodstream. And when sodium is forced into the bloodstream, more water is absorbed and blood volume expands. So there's a lot going on with this fluid thing that we need to kind of know about. But here it goes again. Just a nice little chart to kind of make you see how this fluid volume and the water in your body affects more than just water hanging around. There's your angiotensins. It shows you the retention of sodium. It shows you like all of a sudden you get this salt appetite. You want to drink more. Your blood pressure goes up. So there's a lot of um, factors to think about with this. Um, this is just something for you to think about, about how this in the system helping regulate um, fluids. There's another thing that helps, and this is just anatomy review again. And this is AMP, which is a cardiac hormone, and AKA, um, which is a peptide. Um, and these are stored in cells of the atria, and these are released when your atrial pressure increases. And this counteracts the renin angiotensin, which helps to decrease blood pressure where the other one would increase. This decreases and reduces the intravascular blood volume. Um, so another way to think of this is when blood volume and blood pressure rise and stretches the atria, the, N, the ANP, sounds like an organization, shuts off the renin system and saves the day by stabilizing blood volume and blood pressure. It also decreases the aldosterone from the adrenal gland and it increases the kidney filtering function and this increases the urine excretion of sodium and water and this in turn is going to then decrease ADH, which is released from the pituitary gland. And this is going to cause reduce, uh, reduction of vascular resistance by causing basal dilation. So not only is fluid volume, you have water in the body, but it's regulated by all these different things and it gets very complicated. And I just want you to understand the complication of it by telling you all of this. The AMP rises in response to chronic renal and heart failure. And anything that causes this atrial stretching can cause this amount of AMP to be released, causing orthostatic changes, atrial tachycardia, high sodium intake, sodium chloride infusions um, could also trigger all of this and uh, the uses of blood that causes vasoconstriction. So there's a lot going on here to kind of keep in mind. So also when we're thinking about all these hormones that are regulating everything, we also have to keep in mind that we have fluid compartments in our body, the intracellular and the extracellular. And if you look, the intracellular inside the cells, that's like about 40% of your body weight. And inside of those, in the intracellular, um, there's certain things that like to hang out there, like your potassium and magnesium and your phosphate. And your extracellular, that's outside of the cell, and this includes the intravascular fluid and plasma as well, and interstitial fluids between the cells. And there's certain things that like to hang out there, like your sodiums, your bicarbs, your chlorides, and your calcium. So depending on where these things are coming and going based on those hormones and how much is being pulled here or there will make a big difference on what's happening. Like the spacing of fluid and um, fluid being pulled into compartments where it doesn't need to be. So first spacing when you hear that word or that term used is just fluid normally distributed. I look fine. I'm not holding fluid. Second spacing is when you're starting to accumulate fluid caused by this increased hydros um, hydrostatic pressure or decrease of pressure in the veins and it starts to kind of hide in the interstitial area um, where you can't really see it, but it, it's there. You're holding fluid. It's just not on the outer part. And third spacing is when you start to hide it kind of in places around in your body. Um, like in places like the perineum, um, uh, pancreas, and the intestines.
Medium. Okay. And then you get edema. And edema is just changes in this normal hydrostatic pressure, the differences. And we know that there's edema that's pitting edema. We know that there's edema that's just the regular edema, uh, non-pitting. But you can still see the fluid and you can still tell that it's there. And assessing for edema is a very important thing because we can tell if someone has is holding fluid volume excess, we can tell by this edema. Um, and especially if it's pitting, I know that there's too much fluid in the body. And this could have many causes. It could be because you've had too much fluid intake, too much IV fluid. It could be because your kidneys are not working well, or you have poor perf perfusion, like heart issues, and that's causing poor perfusion to everything, even my kidneys. Or it could have low cardiac output, I could have hypertension, but um, there's many different causes for edema, um, that, but it's all fluid volume excess. That's what pretty much causing it. So then you got the movement of these fluids, and the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane, membrane um, from an area of low concentration to an area of high is osmosis. And so you may hear them talk about that. And you may hear them talk about you have a serum osmolarity that's between 280 and 295. So far this is all stuff to kind of like remind you of what things are uh, moving forward to some of the things you might need to know later. Now there's certain things about the fluids and that we put into our body that's going to help with the movement of things. And a lot of fluids that we like to have in the body are isotonic. These expand your intravascular volume without causing a fluid shift. So if you have someone that's ill, and especially you're trying to really watch that fluid volume intake, but you don't want it to go into fluid overload or excess, an isotonic fluid would be something that you would want to use. This is getting into your IV fluids that you guys may have already started in your other class. You have hypertonic fluids. These are fluids that have given intravenously, kind of pull fluid from the cells. And you have hypotonic, which moves fluid into the cells. So, what does this mean? Let's start with each one. You got your isotonic first, and that's the same osmolarity as your blood volume. And it's going to expand your intravascular volume without causing this fluid shift, some of these shifts we've talked about. So your normal saline, your lactated ringers, these are things that you want because these are going to help in just normal conditions or if someone is in hypovolemic condition, meaning like right after surgery, this is going to help to boost their volume to keep them at homeostasis. Um, a few more tips here about isotonic solutions. Um, is pretty much what we have said. It expands the intravascular compartment without pulling fluid from anywhere else. So everything is status quo. Okay, no movement in and out of the cells. None of that. It stays in status quo. Then we got hypotonic fluid. And hypotonic fluid is, um, by definition, if you look, it's, it's fluids that help move fluid uh, into the cells. It takes, when I give the IV fluid that's hypotonic, it will move fluid into the cells because the intracellular fluid has more pooling power. And this is good if you have someone that's hyperglycemic or in their cellular dehydration would be good, like your dextrose or your half normal saline. Um, if you go here, I think I have um, a, a very nice little picture that shows how it's like uh, going into the dehydrated cell. Hypotonic, like I said, it rehydrates the cells, moving fluid from the blood to the cells. It's used a lot in severe dehydration. Now, there's one thing about these hypotonic solutions that I do want to mention. There is an alert here. Because hypotonic solutions um, are going into the cells, there's certain times they should be avoided. If I already have cerebral edema, I don't need 
the cells in my head there, my brain, to be getting any bigger than they already are if I've already got cerebral edema or if I've already got increased intracranial pressure. This would be a contraindicated fluid in those cases because I would not want that fluid shift in that direction because uh, this could uh, cause further damage. That's a very good question, okay? Um, so, and you also want to um, avoid using them in patients that are at risk for that third space fluid shift, the fluid that you can't see that's hiding out, like your burns or your traumas, um, because we don't want abnormal fluid shifts into that interstitial compartment or body cavity, okay? So hypertonic fluids, what exactly is a hypertonic fluid? Well, those would be used if I need to pull fluid and electrolytes from the cells themselves back into the bloodstream. And this might need to be done to stabilize your blood pressure or to help increase your output or reduce edema. And some examples of those are some of your things like your TPN, your total parental nutrition, uh, your albumins, blood products, and they're going to take from the cell itself and move it into the bloodstream. So, so far we've looked at your body is made up of this water. The water is regulated by all those hormones and different chemicals that are being made by different parts of the body that help raise the blood pressure, decrease it, increase urine output, etc. And then Based on this, our body likes to stay isotonic. Everything's kind of at an equilibrium, a homeostasis. And then, based on what where fluid is accumulating in your body, you can give different substances to help move it out of cells or into cells. And that was your hypo and hypertonic. So hypertonic, taking out of the cells into the bloodstream. Um, this is very important. If you have a person that has congestive heart failure, you want to bring that out of the cells, bring down a lot of that fluid out of the body. Shock neurovascular issues, it's used a lot in uh, post-op patients, used to stabilize blood pressure and regulate urine output. And some of the solutions you will see are like the albumins, uh, blood products, etc., that are kind of expanders expand that blood volume. Another word that you need to keep in mind when we're talking about fluid volume is the word diffusion. The movement of molecules or um, solute like your um, so in your solutions uh, across a semi-permeable membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low. Um, O2 and CO2 diffuse like this all the time across capillary membranes. Another word to kind of keep in mind is you may see the word filtration being used. And um, this is just the process by which water and the substances that are in it, like the electrolytes, move across these membranes in response to all this fluid pressure that we've talked about that are being made by all the different factors in the body. You may, as you're reading, see the word active transport. And this is just the movement of materials across the membrane um, by, but with a little help. Um, they get ATP. You have your sodium potassium pumps that pull potassium into the cell and sodium out of the cell. So you have this regulation of substances to keep things kind of equilibrium in the body. You also have other things that regulate your body fluids, like your thirst center, your hypothalamus. It responds when you have reduction of water. You'll start to get thirsty. It doesn't act as well in older adults. You also have your antidiuretic hormone, or your ADH, which causes the kidney to retain water. When the hypothalamus senses that you have less pressure uh, or volume in your body, it will be secreted to try to uh, help boost things up for you. We've already talked about the renin and angiotensin um, that's used to help regulate um, blood volume, fluid in your body, so that your blood pressure is regulated. And then you have proteins in your body that act as um, 
to attract water, your albumin. And albumin is actually something if someone's real fluid overloaded, they can give them because it'll help attract water and help kind of take some of the fluid out of the bo body if you hear people talk of that. So we have something else to look at here. So all these things are going on in the body. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. So then we get into the fluid volume regulation. What's going on with a person to keep all of this regulated so that we're in homeostasis? And this could vary slightly depending on where you look at, but oral fluids are somewhere around one and a half liters for an adult is what they normally say, give or take. This is kind of like one of those things that's not a hard target. You're going to see different things kind of like listed here or there, but we'll use this as a guideline. Normally, out of this right here, this fluid amount of cc's, um, well, I should have used milliliters, but um, uh, 1,500 milliliters, about 800 milliliters of that comes, from, a lot of it comes from food. And um, it shows you like how one liter of fluid equals one kilogram. So you kind of got a little bit of information there. And the other thing I liked here is with fluid intake, that's something that you should remember, is when you give a patient crushed ice, and let's say I give you eight ounces or 240 milliliters of crushed ice, it is equivalent to half the amount it fills in the container when it melts. So 240 milliliters of crushed ice is really, if the person eats it, 120 milliliters of crushed ice. It's half of what it is. So if I give you 120 milliliters of crushed ice, I can really only take account for 60 milliliters on my INO sheet. So on this right here, what's kind of important to keep in mind is we do get fluid from our food, so we want to keep track of that for our patient. And we do know that a patient needs about one and a half liters of fluid a day usually. And we know that a liter of fluid equals one kilogram, which is important to know if someone is holding fluid inside, like we talked about when we talked about uh, cardiovascular issues. And I like this right here about the crushed ice. That's something very important to know. So fluid regulation, to go back to talk about that just a little bit. If you look on there, it kind of shows you where most of this fluid is uh, going during the day, kind of like an FYI. So the physical assessment that we as nurses need to keep in mind, there's really a lot listed here, but your book lists three simple clinical measures that you can do um, to uh, can initiate be initiated by the nurse without having a primary care provider order. And these are daily weights, vital signs, and fluid intake and output. Um, they say that daily weight is measurement provides a very accurate assessment of a client's fluid status. Uh, significant changes in weight over a short time can indicate fluid changes in the body. And like we said before about a kilo and the one liter of fluid is something very important to keep in mind. So the daily weight seems to be important. So we need to do the daily weight before breakfast in the same clothes, with the same scale, so that we're keeping a very good um, assessment of that. The next thing that's an indicator, if weight is one of the uh, most accurate measures, the other thing that's a very accurate measure is the vital signs. And vital signs, like changes in vital signs, may indicate that that fluid volume, the acid-base imbalance, and all the regulation that we talked about with the angiotensin, now you kind of got this idea where all of that comes into play. Tachycardia is an early sign of hypovolemia, which means too little blood volume. Your pulse volume will decrease when you have a fluid volume deficit is present and increase if there's a fluid volume excess. Irregular heart rates can also occur and there's a lot of electrolyte imbalances going on. And your eyes and nose. 
that's a, something that should be done and you should look at in a 24 hour period so the daily weights the vital signs and the uh, fluid um, the eyes and nose checking the fluids are very very important things that should be looked at also we need to know that because of that angiotensin and all the hormones we talked about orthostatic changes could happen when there's a fluid volume shift a skin turgor is something we need to be assessing for edema uh, they say over the sternum uh, I think you guys learned in your assessment class is the best spot to kind of look at um, to really be able to tell a good uh, status of that looking at mucous membranes seeing if they're if they're dry that's not very good with no saliva that's kind of showing us that we're having like uh, too little fluid in the bottom body mental status changes and also a jugular venous distension could show us too much fluid in the body so if you think about it I'm looking at all of these factors to tell whether you have a fluid volume excess or a fluid volume deficit and a deficit is a loss of fluid I don't have enough fluid volume um, excess is I have too much fluid so kind of um, keeping that in mind there's a little bit here I'll let you read as an FYI in your PowerPoints and then I have some information here that talks about a few of the blood tests that we've talked about before in class one being the hematocrit I've stopped on that one we know that that's your red blood cell volume um, and I know that this increases if there's dehydration or water loss I could have an elevated hematocrit during that time uh, serum creatinine and a BUN these are two things that I would know what those are a serum creatinine measures creatinine is nothing more than a waste product from muscle metabolism and what happens is your kidney gets it out of the body and if you have an elevated creatinine level that means your kidneys not working very well it's not getting that out of the body and that's not a good not good for business and the same is with the blood urea nitrogen if that is increased that's kind of a waste product as well and that means your kidney is not working well enough to get it out of the system and that is not good another thing that we can look at when we're assessing if you've got too much fluid or if you've got too little fluid is we can look at your urine specific gravity and a urine specific gravity is an indicator of urine concentration um, normally your urine um, should be within a certain range this varies depending on book by book um, one of the books I got has the amount that's um, listed there your book um, I was looking at had two different ones it had 1.005 to 1.035 um, so I would make sure on a test I kept it in mind but I want you to know the main thing is if I say a urine specific gravity is high you know it's concentrated okay and that means something's going on with the kidneys ability to uh, get rid of things um, so let's talk about the individual um, things that we have going on here let's talk about fluid volume deficit um, it's when fluids are lost secondary you lose them maybe through diarrhea vomiting you can't take fluids in maybe you're sweating a whole lot like in the summer um, you have an increased metabolic heart um, a metabolic rate due to a fever hypothyroidism maybe some medication that you're on um, and how is it going to manifest itself well you're going to have dry um, and tinting skin which shows you're dehydrated dry mucous membranes you may have your hemoglobin and your hematocrit increased like we saw on the last slide you're going to become very thirsty because the um, because the um, hypothalamus is going to get involved your urine output is going to be low so it's going to be less than 30 milliliters an hour and 30 milliliters an hour is what we should see the body putting out 
you're also going to see that urine-specific gravity being greater than 1.030. It's going to be dark urine. Um, and you might see weight loss in the individual. Um, dehydration is basically just simply when the fluid intake is less than what is needed to meet the fluid needs. And this results in the fluid volume deficit. And um, this usually means we have to administer fluids. Um, to bring the person back to homeostasis, which goes back to the fluids that we talked about earlier. Um, some of the labs, if we run like a CBC and a chemistry on the individual, if someone is in fluid volume deficit mode, their hemoglobin and hematocrit will be elevated. You might see the glucose elevated. Uh, you might see the BUN, the creatinine, different electrolytes. Um, as well. The signs we kind of talked about, looking at skin trigger, membrane, uh, looking at thirst, looking at the eyes and nose, are they equal, are they less? Um, and I'm going to look at the vital signs because of the changes that will occur there. You're going to give um, saline, you're going to give, um, you're going to give fluids, uh, fluid replacement, and offering these fluids to replace the loss. Um, if the person, if something's causing the loss, we got to think about this. We got to fix the loss if something's causing it. So if something's causing this, you, you may have to administer antiemetics to keep the person from throwing up. I know you're dehydrated and your skin is starting to um, show signs of the turgor um, issues. I'm going to turn and reposition you frequently so that the skin doesn't break down. I'm going to make sure that I provide good oral care to rehydrate your mucous membranes, do good eyes and nose, and good physical assessment. Very, very important. Now, there's um, some risk factors here. Um, decreased fluid loss um, and excess. Um, you're going to have, you can have a lot of issues um, that could go wrong with it. Um, decreased fluid loss and excessive IV administration of isotonic fluids. You could start to have some issues with congestive heart failure, renal failure, all kinds of things going on. Okay. Um, then you have the opposite problem. You can have fluid volume overload. That means you have too much fluid in the body. And this may be caused by excessive fluid intake. Um, maybe too much IV fluids, you're drinking too much, uh, your, your kidneys aren't working good, you're not putting out very well, your cardiac output is lower, your blood pressure is high, you're just not getting rid of the fluid, and you're going to usually see that in the signs of edema. So what else am I going to see besides edema? Well, the edema is probably pitting. I'm going to see weight gain. I'm going to hear adventitious lung sounds. And those adventitious lung sounds that I'm going to usually hear are crackles. The person's going to have some trouble breathing. Um, their blood pressure is going to be up. Um, they may have a decreased uh, BUN and hematocrit. Um, moist mucous membranes. Uh, weight's going to be increased. Uh, jugular distension. So what am I going to do? I'm going to encourage them to um, the intake of low sodium food and fluid because uh, I don't want anything that's going to be drawing more water at a time like this. Um, and I'm also going to give diure diuretics as ordered by the physician um, to pull some of this water off the body. And I'm worried about skin breakdown here as well. Um, and I'm going to encourage them to rest. Now, I do want to point out again the three simple measures that we have for really checking a person is the daily, rate, the daily weights is an accurate assessment of fluid status, the changes in the vital signs, and looking at the I's and O's. I do want to point out as well that fontanelles in children are very important to keep in mind. If the fontanelle is bulging, 
that could be a sign of fluid volume excess. If it is sunken, it could be a deficit. So keeping that in mind as well. So what else do we have to know about all of this? There's so many things going on with this fluid volume excess, fluid volume deficit. Um, a lot of times with the excess, we are wanting to give the diuretics and increase the fluid to get out of the body. Um, also, I just want to point it out that the people may have trouble breathing if they're lying flat because of all this extra fluid. So elevating the head of the bed if they have dyspnea is very, very important because, you know, you're worried about... Um, you're worried about the person with um, edema, pulmonary edema, with all this fluid that they're holding on. Um, so assessing, assessing, assessing. Um, also, if you look at this, we have all this fluid shift, and there's a couple of electrolytes to keep in mind. One is sodium, and yes, you must know a sodium level. A normal sodium is 135 to 145. And you got to know that sodium is really important in the body. It helps skeletal muscle contraction and heart contraction and nerve impulse transmission. So it is very, very important to help with the volume of the extracellular fluid as well. So functions, it controls the water balance, regulator of extracellular fluid volume. It generates the, the nerve impulses, and it helps the sodium-potassium pump to kind of regulate how much fluid is in or out of the cells. Um, if I have too little, I have a condition called hyponatremia, 135 or below, um, or below 135, I should say. Um, and a loss of sodium can occur if I lose GI fluids, if I have excessive diuretics and I've lost a lot of urine, um, if I have too much of certain IV fluids, um, that could st simulate um, or cause me to drop my um, sodium intake. And there's also something where the body, a condition where the body makes too much ADH. Um, and when it does, it, it drops the sodium in the body. And this is a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. Just so that you've heard of that before. I'm not going to ask you about that. But I will ask you about a sodium level. And I probably will ask you about if a sodium is high or a sodium is low. Um, so what are some of the characteristics? I would kind of look at the characteristics here and compare them with what's in your book. My nursing care plan for someone with hyponatremia. I'm going to replay sodium losses, uh, give you broths, electrolytes, um, certain fluids. I'm going to really be listening to your lung sounds. Um, I'm going to restrict your water, monitor eyes and nose and your weight, administer diuretics and safety with ambulation because you could, with all these problems, start to have blood pressure changes, which cause some issues with you moving around. Related factors for hypernatremia. Hypernatremia, if hypo is too little, this means you have too much. And this means it's above 145. So if you look at this, it's like you're drowning in the sea. Uh, too much fluid. I've got to get that fluid off. Um, it could be uh, increased um, water loss through hyperventilation, profuse sweating, um, etc. What are some of the defining characteristics of too much um, too much sugar in the system? Of oh, too much sugar, too much salt in the system. I think this is too late at night for me to be doing this. Too much salt. Here's a few of the things that could happen, okay, for hypernatremia. Your nursing care plan, kind of like giving you something here to follow, um, kind of like educating a person on what they should and shouldn't do um, to help regulate that in the system. Um, to go back with sodium again, like I said, just remember what it mainly does. It's a renal, um, it, the regulation is through renal reabsorption or excretion. 
and um, it regulates extracellular volume, fluid volume and distribution, and it maintains our blood volume and helps with nerve impulses and contracting of muscles. And that a normal, a normal level is 135 to 145. So this is something very important to know. So the things you really need to focus on is what does it mean to be fluid volume excess? What does it mean to be um, fluid volume overload? Just knowing that there's things that go into play that help regulate that is about all I really want you to know about that. I want you to know about the daily weights and the I's and O's and the vital signs. And I want you to know how to tell if someone's got too much or too little fluid. The IV fluids are very good to know what an isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic mean. Um, as well as the sodium levels. I would also um, know my potassium levels as well because potassium and sodium kind of work hand in hand together with those uh, potassium sodium pumps. I would know that potassium is a 3.5 to 5.3 is what your book states. Some places go with 3.5 to 5. Um, but sodium is usually always 135 to 145. So I know that this was a lot, uh, and so take care, and there's more coming.